Hi guys, this is Jason Williams DO. This is the Williams Family Medicine Channel, helping you to live your best life. Today I wanted to talk about sleep, and hopefully it won't be so boring that it puts you to sleep, but this information is something that many of my patients can benefit from. First off, it shouldn't be complicated. Sleep should be pretty natural, but it is messed up for many people. In society, it has been common for people to brag about how they can get by with little sleep, but I think there's quite a disadvantage to their health when they do that. I watched a video series about Navy SEAL training. In part of the training, they try to physically exhaust the soldiers to see how they deal with stress. Unfortunately, they found that some soldiers died when they crossed the line of anywhere from three to five days of no sleep. So they had to adjust their training. Apparently in the 1960s, someone set the record for the longest streak of days without sleep and it was 11 days. I don't know why somebody would want to do that to themselves. I've had plenty of personal experience with decreased sleep due to working in the emergency department, shift work and overnight shifts, and I don't like the way it makes me feel. Sleep is complicated. There are many hormones and neurotransmitters that are involved. I'll just discuss a few of these as they are interesting to me. One of them is adenosine. Adenosine is a neurotransmitter that is produced in the brain. It is something as a byproduct in the breakdown of ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and this is the energy currency of your cells. People that use a lot of energy, very active, very busy, they have more of this byproduct left over, which promotes deeper sleep and more prolonged sleep, which makes sense. Next, we have melatonin. Most people know about melatonin. The sequence of events that stimulates it are interesting to me. Light hits your retina, the retina, the back part of your eye. This triggers a nerve that goes to the hypothalamus of your brain. This sends a nerve through your spinal cord to the pineal gland, to the pineal gland in your brain. When this occurs, the pineal gland produces melatonin and melatonin helps you to have improved sleep. Next is orexin. The word orexin comes from the Greek word orexis, which means appetite, because they have found that orexin stimulates appetite. For today's talk, we're going to talk about its effect on sleep. Orexin is a neuropeptide that gets expressed in the neurons by the hypothalamus again. When this occurs, they actually stimulate feeding and wakefulness. So inhibiting orexin improves sleep. There are a whole slew of hormones that affect sleep also. One of those is progesterone. As females experience perimenopause and menopause, their progesterone levels start to decrease. When that occurs, unfortunately, they have poor sleep. Halopregnenolone is a metabolite of progesterone. This metabolite helps to stimulate GABA neurotransmission. In some of my other videos, I've talked about GABA being the calming effect type hormone or neurotransmitter. GABA neuron stimulation inhibits histamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and orexin, these things that affect sleep. Estrogen deficiency also occurs in perimenopause and menopause, and unfortunately this results in hot flashes which can interfere with sleep. Thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism affects sleep, People that are hyperthyroid often have an increasing heart rate, tremor, and increased anxiety. Hypothyroidism has been associated with increased incidence of obstructive sleep apnea, which can also interfere with sleep. High cortisol levels have been found to interfere with sleep. People that have elevated cortisol level have increased anxiety and difficulty sleeping. Hyperinsulinemia also affects sleep. People that have elevated insulin levels hold on to fluid and salt and this can result in increased need for urination, which can also interfere with sleep. There are many other connections. This is just a brief overview. Some of the effects that sleep has on your hormones are also interesting. When I talk with patients about metabolic health and improving lifestyle, one of the things I want them to do is exercise and lifting weights sometimes can be part of that. If you consider that growth hormone, a hormone that helps to regulate repair of your muscles is affected by sleep, then you would want to emphasize the importance of sleep. People that have less sleep than they should have decreased growth hormone and therefore cannot repair their muscles as well and don't recover as well from workouts. In a similar discussion, leptin levels are affected by sleep. Leptin is a hormone secreted by fat cells. As this level decreases, 
you have increased appetite. People that have poor sleep, unfortunately, have decreased levels and increased appetite. Ghrelin is a hunger hormone secreted by the stomach. This level is increased by poor sleep. And unfortunately, when this level increases, your appetite increases. So both leptin and ghrelin are adversely affected by poor sleep and can result in poor weight loss or unfortunately weight gain. As we talk through this, you're going to see that improved sleep can result in significant health benefits. There are four commonly accepted stages of sleep. Uh, phase one, lasting one to seven minutes, very light sleep, kind of a decreased heart rate occurs during this episode. Phase two maybe lasts for 25 minutes and it is between a light and a deeper sleep. You have increased brain electrical activity during this phase. Phase three takes 30 to 40 minutes and results in a deeper sleep and it's very hard to arouse during this phase. You will have decreased motor activity during this phase of sleep. Phase four might last from 10 to 60 minutes and is accepted as what's called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. This is a deep sleep, but also a sleep where you will have long-term memory formation. It is common for people to cycle through these phases of sleep and maybe have four or five cycles at night if you get adequate sleep. I guess when we talk about sleep, we should just mention the word circadian. The word actually means circa day or about a day. This just stands for your sleep-wake cycle should be about 24 hours or a day in length. I want to read a list of common causes of poor sleep, so I don't leave anything out. Stress, anxiety, pain, sleep apnea, mood disorder, noise, light, uncomfortable surroundings, substance use, PTSD, COPD, CHF, allergies, sinus and airway deformity, large adenoids and tonsils, asthma, thyroid disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, pregnancy, itching, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, neuropathy, restless leg syndrome, traumatic brain injury, headache, brainstem stroke, and shift work. So with this list, you'll see multiple different kind of health problems, and these things need to be addressed and treated, otherwise your sleep will be affected. Many patients take medications that can affect their sleep, and I want to review some of these as they are important and are common. Obviously, one that would lead the list is CNS stimulants, such as medicines for attention deficit disorder or even weight loss. These cause increased anxiety, sometimes tremor, and promote wakefulness. Steroids are another medication that interfere with sleep. Steroids probably act by a couple of mechanisms, one of which is they decrease tryptophan production. Tryptophan is an amino acid that is a precursor to serotonin, which is also a precursor to melatonin, our friend that helps us with sleep. Also, unfortunately, steroids decrease GABA neurotransmission, the calming neurotransmitter. Beta antagonist medications have been shown to decrease melatonin levels by as much as 80% interfering with sleep. Diuretics cause increased wakefulness because of need to urinate and frequent need to get up in the middle of the night. Some antidepressants can interfere with sleep by increasing serotonin levels, which decreases REM sleep. Caffeine also interferes with these neurotransmitters as it increases serotonin levels, adrenaline, and norepinephrine levels. Alcohol inhibits melatonin production and decreases REM sleep. Beta agonists such as bronchodilators for asthma and COPD can also interfere with sleep by causing jitteriness and increased wakefulness. No discussion about sleep should leave sleep apnea out of the mix. Sleep apnea is very common and affects a large portion of the population. People that have sleep apnea might experience snoring, episodes of apnea where they stop breathing, sore throat or dry mouth, frequent headaches in the morning, and somnolence during the day, sometimes falling asleep at a stoplight in their car. On a side note, sleep apnea has been found in women when searched for especially perimenopausal or menopausal women, they seem to have decreased estrogen and progesterone levels that affect the tissue tone. When the tissue tone in the upper airway is affected, it is easier for it to collapse during sleep, resulting in obstructive sleep apnea. So it is easy to miss the classic sleep apnea type of body habitus with a male who is overweight and has a large 
neck and a short neck, whereas a woman may not look so overweight and may not match the body habitus that you might expect with sleep apnea, and yet they can still have this condition. Sleep apnea has been linked to cardiovascular disease as well as poor performance in school, work, increased accidents, and even death from car crashes, unfortunately. Because sleep apnea is common, we have many different treatments that we try for it. Some people are able to get by with dental appliances that perform a jaw thrust, which moves the tongue out from the airway, allowing the airway to remain open during sleep. There are what are called myofunctional speech therapy exercises that can be helpful. These things involve tongue and mouth exercises. Uh, keep in mind there is some cross benefit here as some of these exercises such as loud singing, swallowing, gargling, etc. can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and decrease stress. If you have seen my video about stress, you will see this part. I read a study about people that play the Australian woodwind instrument, instrument the didgeridoo, have decreased incidence of sleep apnea and improved sleep apnea scores. When playing this instrument, you have to inhale through your nose and breathe out almost constantly through your mouth to play the instrument properly. We have nasal valve devices that you can use at night that help to cause positive pressure on your airway to keep your airway open when breathing. Some patients try behavioral therapy where they use a tennis ball or rolled up socks taped on their back to prevent them from rolling on their back, which also is commonly associated with sleep apnea. Of course, people try CPAP devices. These are continuous positive airway pressure device machines that help to keep the airway open during sleep. There are a few surgical options such as a hypoglossal nerve stimulator, which involves surgery with a stimulator lead that causes increased tone in the tongue to keep it out of the airway. There is uvulopalatoplastal surgery. This involves resecting part of the pharyngeal airway to keep it open so that you don't have complete obstruction during sleep. And there is what is called maxillomandibular advancement, which is a dental type surgery which changes the jaw and moves it forward, once again, to kind of cause a tongue thrust type of scenario. Next, I wanted to talk about restless leg syndrome as it is very common and can be debilitating for patients' quality of life. There are some theories about how this condition develops. They think that dopamine receptor antagonism might be part of the issue, meaning the dopamine cannot access the receptors to trigger its effects. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps to cause vasodilation or increased blood flow. And the theory is that if you have decreased blood flow to the muscles, then you may have pain or this increased need to move the legs during sleep, resulting in sleep impairment. A theory about iron deficiency is also very prevalent in regards to restless leg syndrome. Iron deficiency has been identified to decrease dopamine receptor binding sites and therefore have the same effect of not enough blood flow to tissues and possibly increase this restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome has been associated with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in a small study that I saw in the Journal of Gastroenterology. Treatment with antibiotics for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, such as rifaximin, result in improved restless leg syndrome in these patients. Larger sample size studies are ongoing Treatment with gut microbiome medications might be helpful though, such as probiotics or even antibiotics such as rifaximin. Low-dose naltrexone has been a novel treatment that is being tried by functional medical practitioners with uh, some results of success. Low-dose naltrexone modifies opioids in your body. Basically, used in very low dose, the naltrexone occupies opioid or endorphin receptor sites. Briefly, as this occurs, your body generates more endorphins as a compensatory response. When these receptors are unblocked, then more endorphins are present. As the endorphins bind, they also seem to have a vasodilatory effect, improving blood flow to organs. Dose naltrexone also affects the immune system. And when people think about gut health, gut microbiome health, and the immune system, Low-dose naltrexone has been tried for this, as well as treatment with probiotics. A third thing that I saw was lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is a milk glycoprotein 
that seems to affect iron metabolism. Lactoferrin decreases hepcidin levels. Hepcidin is a peptide that is released by your liver to help regulate iron metabolism. When that level is high, it is common to have iron deficiency, which iron deficiency has been linked to restless leg syndrome. So if you can use lactoferrin and decrease hepcidin levels, you may be able to increase iron stores and maybe prevent or treat restless leg syndrome. These three things are not going to be heavily supported by evidence-based medicine studies, just so you know, but they're being tried and there are some successes reported in the functional medicine arena here. I wanna now go through a couple of the medications that are used for sleep disorders. First of all, melatonin, most people know about that one. Supplement, modest effects, sometimes is effective for some patients. Next, there are melatonin receptor agonist, such as Romelteon, and this makes sense in somebody that is on a beta blocker medication that has a decreased melatonin level, as we discussed earlier, maybe this would be effective for them. If you have itching, you might consider a histamine antagonist such as doxepin for sleep. We have orexin receptor antagonist, as discussed earlier, if you inhibit orexins, you have improved sleep. And this is a fairly new class of medications. For restless leg syndrome, we have dopamine agonists such as ropinopril. Some of the older treatments we have, such as benzodiazepine receptor agonists like zolpidem and benzodiazepine hypnotics like temazepam are out there as well. These have addictive nature and addictive properties, unfortunately. I'm gonna read a few of the off-label treatments that we use sometimes as well for sleep. We use off-label medications in medicine frequently. It's just good to identify these and tell patients that they are off-label. Antidepressants such as Desiril or Mirtazapine, antipsychotics such as Quetiapine, anxiolytics such as Clonazepam, antihypertensives such as Clonidine, and antiepileptics such as Gabapentin. These have all been used with some success for some patients in sleep. Sleep is very important. It seems like it should be simple, but there's a lot to it. If you have poor sleep, you're going to have poor health at some point or another. It may not catch up to you right away, but it will eventually. If you're my patient, use this information about sleep for your overall health. If you're not my patient, you should talk to your own doctor about your diagnosis and treatment. This is Jason Williams-Dio. This is the Williams Family Medicine Channel, helping you to live your best life. Signing off.